taking up $700 in that offering. So, that'll help our church treasury out, will it? Yeah. Praise God. I'm glad for everyone's here this morning. Praise God. Thanks to good friends, brothers and sisters in the Lord. But let's stand. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Hallelujah. strokes and stuff like that. We've been trying to pray for him. The Lord gives him deliverance. It's frustrating when you get older and can't do what you used to do. Thank God. Tomorrow's his birthday, too. Tomorrow's his birthday. That'd be a good birthday, Brad. Lord bless you. Praise God. And I still remember the Capitillo family. And there was uh, something else. So Sister Felicia, she was asking to pray for the kids. The other day, and they're all doing good. Looks like you're doing good. Yes. Got a smile on his face, anyway. Praise the Lord. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask the Lord to bless this service. Here. Lord, we love you, Jesus. Thank you. Jesus, mercy, you have been so good to us, Lord. I can't thank you. Thank you for the fellowship service that we had, Lord. Most of all, this is a new day, Lord.
whether we feel like praising him or not, we need to praise him because he is worthy of our praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. to be a pastor at that church. Lord help you. Praise God. I don't, I don't think the young man's in it for the money. He, he's, he's, he's trying to do work different places and sometimes it takes a while when you kind of feel out your ministry what God wants you to do. But a lot of them start out as evangelists and wind up setting them down to be a pastor and some of them start out as pastors and wind up side being evangelists but Lord just help them to to make this call in an election, sure. Praise God. I'm going to be going to the book of Matthew, chapter 15. Yeah. Hallelujah. I don't know what you call it. Pressing you need a miracle. Hallelujah. But, you know, we're serving a God that's great and can do anything. Praise God. We need to have enough faith to see God work in our lives. Praise God. So Matthew chapter 15, I want to read verse 26 and 27. And then I'm going to go to Philippians chapter 4, and verse 19, which is most of us could probably quote it. Matthew 15, 26. But he answered and said, It is not meat to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord. Yet the dogs eat from the, of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. You can be seated. Praise God. You know, I, the children's bread. You know, back then, anything that wasn't a Jew wasn't a child of God. But now, Anybody that doesn't accept him is not a child of God. But we're all children of God. We don't have to satisfy ourselves with crumbs. You know, I don't want to have the attitude of the prodigal son's brother that complained that his dad never gave him so much as a kid of the goats to, to have with his friends. And his dad's like, son, it was all yours to start with. Yeah, he got his inheritance, but the rest is yours. Mm -hmm. And we tend to forget that sometimes. We have access to the bread, not the crumbs. Hallelujah. He wants us to live for him. Hallelujah. Victoriously. Hallelujah. And she said, truth, Lord. Hallelujah. He called her a dog. You know, she came. She came probably expecting that attitude from the Jews. She knew the way they felt about Gentiles. And when he said, she said, it's not me to give the children's bread and cast it to the dogs, she said, truth, Lord. Some people would have got offended. They would have got mad and stomped off. But this lady had a need, and she was going to press towards what she wanted. Right? She just said, Yet the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And when you touch Jesus with faith, he can't resist. Now I'm going to say this. We feel like sometimes this morning that, you know, well, maybe he don't want to. It's not his will to heal me. Or it's not his will to do this. I find no place in the Bible when Jesus was walking on earth where he turned anybody away. 
Everywhere I read about him doing miracles and everywhere he went, he healed all that came to him. He didn't turn anyway. His disciples tried to turn some children away. And he said, no, <laughs> suffer the little children coming to me. So when you have a petition with God, he wants to heal you. You know, whatsoever we ask in faith, believing according to his will, it's his will to heal you. Hallelujah. So I'll get into that a little bit more in a moment. But in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19, but my God shall supply all, all your need according to his riches and glory. He owns it all by Jesus Christ. He owns it all. So there's nothing he can't give you. I'm going to kind of just mention through some, some miracles that Jesus did, familiar stories, but Jesus feeds 5,000. It's recorded in Matthew 14, 13 through 21, Mark chapter 6, uh, verses 30 through 44. You got Luke chapter 9, verses 10 through 17. And then in John chapter 6, verses 1 through 15. And Jesus had just crossed over the Sea of Galilee, and people were following him. And he, uh, he came to a place, and there was crowds of people coming to him, and him and his disciples found a place on the mountainside to go sit, and the people started coming. A lot of these had followed him across the sea. People knew he was there. They'd seen him heal people of sickness and diseases, the story goes, and they're coming to Jesus to be healed. A lot of these people hadn't eaten, and uh, Jesus looks at Philip and says, uh, where can we find bread to feed these? And he said it, the Bible says, to test Philip. Because Jesus knew what he was going to do. And I go back to what I've said at different times. We remember this, Jesus who knew all things. He knows what you have need of. He asked Philip, where can we find bread to feed all these? There's two attitudes there. And hey, I, I want to point this out. Philip, he said, Lord, I don't know if it's because they had 200 penny worth or it was considered a lot of money, but he said 200 penny worth of bread wouldn't be enough to feed all these people. And he said, there's a lad here that has five barley loaves and two small fishes, and Jesus said it's enough. But he did this to prove Philip. There's one of two ways you can approach this. If you're a beginner living for God, Lord, 200 penny worth of bread isn't enough to feed these people. But if you've been living for God for a while, Philip could have said, Lord, I don't know. It's, you know, you want me to find someone who's got a little bit of food here if you can multiply it? God wants us to get to the point where we know what he would do. He don't want us to come to him questioning all the time. Well, I don't know if he'll do this. Look, this is your father. There's probably not anybody here that's grown up in a household that didn't know how their mother and father were going to react. When a child asks for something. That's why sometimes they go to mom and ask. And sometimes they go to dad and ask. Because they, they get the answer they want from whichever one they're asking about. They know what they're doing. Hallelujah. But Jesus fed 5,000 people with five barley loaves and two small fishes. Hallelujah. And then he received a temple tax from a fish's mouth. In the story of Matthew chapter 17 verses 24 through 27. The tax collectors, or the ones that collected the tribute money, said to Peter, doesn't your master pay taxes to Caesar? And Peter said, yes. And then he went to talk to Jesus. And what's interesting in the story is that Peter was coming to Jesus, and he didn't get to ask. Jesus said, said uh, who is it that pays taxes? Is it, is it the king's children? Or is it others? And Peter said, others, I suppose. He said, then the king's children are, are free. He said, yeah. And uh, Jesus said, <clears throat> nonetheless, that we not offend somebody. That's important now. Nevertheless, that we not offend. He told him to go down the sea, cast in a hook, get a little coin out of the first fish's mouth that he's seen, and go pay our taxes with it. But he said that we not <clears throat> offend. I've seen 
Christian people in a situation where someone says, hey, uh, you know, so-and-so's house burnt down and we're taking up a, doing a raffle here and you can pay $5 for a ticket for a chance to win a <laughs> shotgun or a deer rifle or a muzzle or whatever it is they're trying to, to raffle off. And I've seen people get the reaction, no, I ain't buying no tickets. I don't believe in gambling. And they walk off. That's offensive. But we're not supposed to gamble. You're right. Or you could say, well, I don't really believe in gambling. And that's what it is to me. But I would like to donate. You know, I don't want no tickets. But I'll give you $20 to, you know, toward the cause. Now there's a whole different reaction there. Because now they're looking at you. They respect you for your principles. But they're not offended at you because you still have heart enough to want to help. And God wants us to help others. You know, giving and helping other people is all part of God's will. He don't want us just to sit on what we got. Hallelujah. He wants us to have a heart for other people. And then Jesus heals a blind man. You know, at, at Bethsaida. Hallelujah. And this is the man that, you know, came to Jesus. He was blind. And Jesus prayed for him. And he said, now, how do you see? He says, I see men like trees walking. So he prayed again. That lets us know, church, there's nothing wrong with praying. I, I, I don't believe Jesus made a mistake and didn't quite do enough, you know, to heal this man's eyes. He did that for a purpose. That we can know. Now you pray for somebody and it does not pray again. I like that song Brother Pizzuti used to sing. Till the answer comes, you got to keep praying. you got to keep praying. And you know, we prayed for Sister Henson the other night at her house a while back. You know, she couldn't use her arm to live. We prayed for her, and she started using her arm, you know. And then she kind of sitting there started crying. And said, What's wrong, Mom? And she said, it's pitiful. I can't move my leg. And I said, well, we'll pray again, you know. And she got up and started walking around the house. There's nothing wrong with praying twice. And I believe that's why Jesus had that story in there. You know, Jesus calms storms. He can calm any storm in your life. It don't matter whether it's financial, whether it's physical, whatever the problem is, Jesus can calm those storms. When he recorded that story in Matthew chapter 8, 23 through 27, he recorded it in Luke 18, you know, 22 through 25. And then in Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41, hallelujah. They were crossing over the sea. Now, this ain't like some huge pond or something, okay? I mean, this, this took long enough. He had time to go in the back of the boat and take a nap. All right? So he's taking a nap there in the boat. And the Bible says that other ships were following him. So the disciples weren't the only one in, the, in that storm. I don't believe he let any others drown either. But uh, here they are. And the storm catches them and is tossing them. And the boat's filling up with water. And they run back to Jesus and said, Master, Master, don't you care that we perish? And uh, Jesus got up and said uh, two things. He said, why are you so fearful? And how is it that you have no faith? Now, they had faith, okay? Because they knew that if they went and woke up Jesus... The storm would stop. Hallelujah. They were afraid they wouldn't make it through the storm. Why is it that we have no faith? We gotta have faith. Great faith. Hallelujah. But he said, Why are you so fearful? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Why are you so fearful? We shouldn't be afraid. I understand. You know, when we're new converts, and we've never, and, and it's sad to say that there's a lot of people that's been in church a long time that never really get to the point where they've asked God enough times that they realize you don't have to be fearful. God's promises are true. Hallelujah. They're true. And miracles didn't stop when Jesus ascended. Mark 16 and 20. Says it, and they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. 
God confirms his word. Uh, you know, it's sad, and it really trips up a lot of people. But just because God does a miracle doesn't mean that person is right. The person that received it or the person that prayed. We feel like a lot of times that, well, you know, it must be a great preacher because, you know, he does miracles. He didn't do the miracle. God did. That Syrophoenician woman that Jesus prayed for, she wasn't right. It wasn't time for the Gentiles to be saved yet. They didn't have an opportunity to turn to Christ. Right? She was lost as lost could be. But faith touched him, and he healed that woman's daughter. The Roman centurion, you know, Jairus' daughter. He healed that girl because faith touched him. <coughs> You know, Lord, no, Lord, I'm not worthy. You come under my roof. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a man of authority. I say to this one, come, and he comes. I say to this one, go, and he goes. I know all you have to do is just say it, and it'll be there. It'll be that way. He just couldn't resist that faith. He said, this man's not even a Jew. He doesn't have generational backgrounds that see me part the Red Sea, part, part the River of Jordan at flood stage. He hasn't seen all these miracles. He doesn't have this stories from his family tree. And here he's got greater faith than the Jews that are alive right now. I mean, faith touches him. Hallelujah. But uh, the miracles didn't stop when Jesus ascended. And he didn't stop when the last of the apostles passed off the scene like a lot of preachers try to say nowadays. God still does miracles. Hallelujah. I want people to feel like something is, you know, so big or so hard, you know. I don't care what it is. It's cancer. Death. God's able to change it. Hallelujah. Someone said, oh, bro, see, well, you just don't understand how bad my situation is. Well, Luke chapter 1 and verse 37 says, for with God, nothing, nothing, nothing shall be impossible. This is the God that can do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. You don't know how bad my situation is. You just don't understand how great our God is. Hallelujah. He can do it. Praise God. Miracles and healings are a necessary part of an apostolic church. I know we pray for things sometimes. And sometimes we don't receive. And I, you know, I'm thinking back to some of the things Brother uh, Owens was preaching when he was talking about why we don't get prayers answered. You know, sometimes it's our attitude. Well, I hate to bother God about that. I don't really deserve it. And sometimes it's something in our life that's causing us to have that attitude. There's something in our life that we don't feel like, hey, you know, I shouldn't be doing this. And it's, it's taking a hold on us. And it's killing your faith. Hallelujah. Or if there's something wrong, man, search yourselves. You know, David prayed, search me, O oh God, and know my heart. He already does. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, search me, O oh God, know my heart. He said, try me and know my thoughts. And lead me in the way everlasting. God will help you to see what the problem is. Hallelujah. We don't have to take a tough head. Put God first in everything we do. Hallelujah. An apostolic church should be a place. Hallelujah. Where lives can be changed. Where sinners can feel the convicting power of God. If they can't, there's something wrong. Where miracles still happen, just like they did in the early apostolic church. Hallelujah. Brother Stone preached the message one time. You know, are we lining up with the book of Acts? And somebody said, well, you know, that was years worth of time all compiled in one book. And, you know, if we were to take a uh, bunch of testimonies from people and write it all down in a book, it would seem like that's nothing but God did nothing but sit there and do miracles and heal people. Well, I'm telling you, it don't matter how long it took. God still did those miracles, and he still does today. Hallelujah. And if it's not in the apostolic.
Apostolic Church, then something's wrong. I can understand it not being in places where the truth's not taught or it's preached. Hallelujah. Where people don't want to live right. But it, it, it's, it's a terrible situation when the church gets to the point that God can't work. You know, are we getting too familiar with him? That he can't work in our lives? Like when he was in his hometown and he said he could do many great miracles? He could have done it anyway. He was not going to because of unbelief. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But I'm here this morning to tell you that God can heal and take care of any situation. If you have a need, we can pray right here and God will supply that need. When the prayer of faith is prayed, God heals. So and so, well, Brother Ray, you better watch what you say. You're putting yourself on the spot. Well, church, I don't do miracles. God does. I'm not putting me on the spot. I'm telling you what the Word says. And God is not a liar. Hallelujah. If we don't get what we receive or receive what we need from God, the problem is not God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because it doesn't matter. Hallelujah. When we pray, a lot of people want to find some great minister somewhere, someone that's got a history of praying for people and them seeing miracles, and that's good. But, you know, when you start doing that, oh, if, if I could only get to Brother Hancock, I know I'd be healed. You put your faith in Brother Hancock. It's God. It doesn't matter whether it's a preacher or a little kid. It's God. When faith reaches out, be honest, sometimes it's probably better off for a little kid to pray for you because they're expecting it to happen. You've told them it will. Hallelujah. Well, you've got to be careful. Mark chapter 16 and verse 17. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name, they shall cast out devils. There's people come up church, I ain't never seen the devil cast out. Don't even know what to do. When it's being done. I've seen it happen in the church sometimes. You know, some of these people, look, you kids quit playing around, man. You're just leaving yourself susceptible to have that devil jump on you. I ain't never seen the devil come out of somebody and start jumping on different people in the church. But he'll do that. You better be careful. Hey, they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. And they shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. And they shall lay hands on the sick, and they might recover. It says shall. Hallelujah. They shall. It's a promise from God. Hallelujah. I have a, I've had denominal preachers tell me that miracles were just for the apostles' day. No faith. Scare some of them if, if it really did happen. I think of that young lady that's back here with Brother uh, Kevin Tillman the other night. Uh, church of Christ. She said, I was, we were Rose and I were at church the other night. She, she started praying. Brother Owens was preaching. And, and all of a sudden she started talking in tongues. And, and she looked at Brother Owens. She said, I'm saying words I don't even know what they are. Just keep praying, honey. Just keep praying. A little smile come on her face. And Holy Ghost just took over. Man, she, she got excited. Hallelujah. She's never seen. She's been told all her life, you can't do that. You can't get the Holy Ghost today. She just knew she needed God. She just started praying. All of a sudden, these words started coming out of her mouth. i like to see that. Praise God. Even today, <coughs> what about Linda Tennant? People from this church right here prayed for that woman. Turned her life from the waist down as she got up and walked. Brother William Hopper, one leg shorter than the other. And God made them both the same length. And while he was at it, he healed the back problem he had as a result of having one leg shorter than the other. Brother Charlie Weekly did for I think it was 13 hours. Church prayed or wait for his pastor to get there but they prayed and he got back up and continued with his ministry. Hallelujah. Brother 
Terry Peterson. He came up here for prayer because he's going to that that doctor the next day to be checked out about his cancer situation. And he wanted us to pray that God would take that cancer away. And he 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 really didn't have as much faith as it seemed because he was telling me, he said, Brother Ray, he said, if I've done anything to offend you, please forgive me. I said, you don't have to worry about that. I ain't holding a grudge against nobody. But we prayed. And he called me back the next day and he said, guess what? I said, what, Terry? And I was expecting to hear a good report. He said, the doctor said my cancer is gone. And he said, not only that, they can't even find a trace of it in my blood. Well, he died later on, COVID, but it wasn't cancer. Hallelujah. But God still does miracles. And what about an outpouring of the Holy Ghost? People are still getting the Holy Ghost today. You know, I seen Amanda and Abby get the Holy Ghost. Destiny and Nikki get the Holy Ghost. You know, it's something different when you see kids get it like that. I know sometimes kids get it really young and they don't, it's like they don't really understand it that well. But, you know, I see like Amanda, she... She gets in services. I see her once in a while over her face. She starts talking in tongues, has her hands in the air. The Spirit of the Lord touches her. Don't lose that, you know. They don't need to lose that. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And without a doubt, hallelujah. Us as apostolics, without a doubt, serve the God of the supernatural and the miraculous. I don't care what anybody says. They can say all they want that God doesn't do miracles anymore. And he's come, they've come too late to tell them. Yeah. Hallelujah. Contrary to what some believe, we are serving a God that still does miracles for his people. He loves you. He's not going to forsake you. He cares what you're going through. He knows right where you're at. Hallelujah. Sometimes I think we just fail to ask. lost his power. He ain't lost a bit of it. Matter of fact, uh, it's not getting weaker. It's getting strong, getting stronger. Hallelujah. The book of the book says all power. If there was anything lacking while he was walking on earth, which I don't think there was, but he said, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. All we use that sometimes in one God arguments. Well, if Jesus had all power, then there's none left for the Holy Ghost and the Father. But we understand who Jesus is. Hallelujah. All power in heaven and earth. Isaiah 50 and 2. Is my hand shortened at all that I cannot redeem? Or have I no power to deliver? Isaiah 59 and 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save. Neither his ear heavy, that he cannot hear. Hallelujah. If God heard prayer back then, he'll hear it today. If God delivered back then, he'll still deliver today. If God did miracles back then, he'll still do miracles today. I don't care how many thousand years has gone by. Hallelujah. He'll still do it today. God is no respecter of persons. Hallelujah. And his hand is not short. If we're not receiving the pro promise, then it's because we're not complying to the conditions of the promise. Hallelujah. Examine ourselves. Hallelujah. I don't want our young people just to enjoy church. Hallelujah. I want them to have a love for God. There's a difference. I know some kids you know, are going to come to church and say, well, you know, I'm going to go with all the relatives are going to be there, my aunties and uncles. You know, it's going to be great. My cousins are there. We're going to have a good time. We don't want them. That's good to enjoy being in church and being with the fellowship with other believers. But I want them to have a love for God. There's a difference. And you get to a point. I remember my wife talking about she wanted to rededicate herself one time, you know. That love and that relationship with God. Hallelujah.
know, you get the Holy Ghost sometimes when you're young. I see kids that have got it. They go through it and you don't ever see them talking tongues anymore. And then they get older and they feel like, well, you know, I need to get it again. There's a time in our life when it needs to stop just being because mom and dad said so and get it for yourself. It needs to be in your heart for yourself. There needs to be a relationship. Hallelujah. You'll see it come. Hallelujah. When all of a sudden they start having a desire to study the word for themselves. Praise God. It's important. It's not a coincidence. Hallelujah. That a man to pray for a mom and got him. It's not a coincidence that slave can pray for mamma over the phone and it happens. Someone said, oh, that's cute. No, it's faith. They've been taught that. Hallelujah. It wasn't a coincidence that Nikki praying for a man up here in the front. God gave her a miracle just like that. Hallelujah. It's faith. Hallelujah. And that's what we need. We preach it. And sometimes it seems like some of us older saints let down on it. Hallelujah. We need to preach it more and more. But what if God doesn't do it? It's not nothing on me. I don't do the miracles. I'm telling you what the book says. Hallelujah. And God's book doesn't lie. He can't lie. You know, I, I don't know everything he's going through. Whether we were what, 15, maybe 18 of us here this morning. I don't know what we're all going through. But God does. Hallelujah. You may feel like your situation is a giant looming up before you. I don't know what to do. I can't handle this. But if that giant in front of you can see that God behind you, like the song says, he'd be on his knees. If old Goliath couldn't look past David and see the God that was going to fight for him standing behind him, oh, let's just quit right now. You win, I give. Hallelujah. He's not going to let us down, church. <coughs> I've heard people make the statement, I'm afraid to get too close to God for fear of what the devil might do to me. That's the spirit of fear. Hallelujah. And I'll remind you what Revelation 21 and 8 says, but the fearful, the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the whoremongers and the sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Fearful? <clears throat> I'm right in there with a murderer because I'm fearful. I'm right in there with idolaters because I'm unbelieving. What's he saying here? We all get scared sometimes. I'm not talking about being scared. Okay? And he's not talking about just being afraid of something. You know? You go down past at night and a bear comes out and starts chasing you. You probably won't be afraid. You know, I seen that little picture one time. I was pretty good. I used to ride bicycles a lot. I've been chased by a lot of dogs. But uh, the little picture shows a grizzly bear chasing a man on a bicycle. Man, he was standing up pumping them pedals. And sometimes you find inspiration, and sometimes inspiration finds you. <clears throat> Lord, I don't want to have to go through it that way to be inspired, Lord. Praise God. But we get afraid sometimes. But this is talking about doubting whether God can do it or not. Being afraid that he won't do it. You're his child. He will do it. Hallelujah. <clears throat> if he withholds something from you, it's for a reason. But daddy, I really want this. No, I ain't not gonna do right now. <laughs> but why? And we'll just Hallelujah. Sometimes God gives you a way. Why I don't know. Sometimes it's because something's wrong on our part, not complying with the condition of the promise. When we need to examine ourselves. Hallelujah, the Bible says. Hallelujah. I want to be right with God. When, when judgment day comes, I don't want to hear, depart from me, you that work iniquity. I want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful 
stuff in the church. Hallelujah. You got to think in a broader scope of things. If you let down on the word just to get a number, that's all you're getting is a number. You know? If you let down on the word to get more people coming and paying more money, God, your God is the money. Hallelujah. Jesus told the, the religious rulers of the day, he wasn't looking for man's glory. He wasn't looking for the approval of man. That's not what he was looking for. Okay? He wanted the love. He wanted someone to love him. Not just to approve of him. Hallelujah. We need to be careful. I don't just want to approve of God. I want to love God. That's what he's looking for. Hallelujah. People overlook stuff and say, well, I don't want to overlook this because I don't want to offend somebody. You know, well, there's a difference between offending like I was talking about earlier and there's a difference between offending somebody because they got a lot of money and you don't want to run them off so you're going to let stuff go. Are you going to let a soul die and go to hell for your own personal agenda? I can't do that. Hallelujah. We've got to, we've got to think of things on the spiritual side. There are souls that need to be saved. And if we don't tell them, who's going to? We've got Brother Jeremy, you can don't believe he's there. <laughs> Just believe he's there. But I'm about to wind this up. Hallelujah. You don't have to be there. You know, our God is much, much more powerful than any devil. Converted devil worshipers will tell you the same thing. Brother Rhodes, talking to Brother Scott, working down there at the store. Brother Rhodes, I started preaching. Brother Scott told us a lot of Satanists. Brother Rhodes told us God has more power than the devil. He says, oh, no, the devil has more power. Brother Rhodes told us, all right. We'll just pray and see about it. Brother Scott finally found out that God did have more power than the devil. He'd tell you that from the pulpit. Hallelujah. Devil worship in schools, where we work. It's, it's, it's a lot of things going on around this church. We don't even realize how bad it's getting. And this world's been crazy. But they need the Holy Ghost just like anybody else. Someone, this question has come up in school about in schools around this area about whether or not to put a litter box in the bathroom. For people that associate with being a cat. I mean, the world's going crazy. You know, he's a boy, but he associates with being a girl. So let him go to the girl's bathroom. Let him go to the girl's shower. And let him know. Uh, or she associates with being a boy, so she can go to the boy's bathroom. The world's going crazy. If you want to be a cat, okay, we'll put a litter box in the bathroom. So I'm like, <laughs> there ain't no way. <laughs> then who's going to change that litter box? Uh, Jerry said, I don't have to worry. We ain't putting no litter box in this school. <laughs> uh, it's just the world's going crazy, church. Stuff don't even make no sense. Hallelujah. You know, saints, if you're where you should be with God, you don't have to. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. <coughs> if you really serve God like we're supposed to, you got to do this. You don't have to fear that devil. That devil will fear you. I know Brother Fred Gibble told us about going to the mission field one time. I forgot what missionary he was with. <coughs> but I think it was in Brazil somewhere. And they're walking down the road and all of a sudden this witch doctor coming down the road started going in all these funny jerks and moves and <clears throat> running across to the other side of the road and walked around like he was trying to get around a rattlesnake. Well, the guy's like, what in the world is wrong with that man? He said, that man's a witch doctor. He's devil possessed. And 
that devil recognizes the Holy Ghost that's in us, and he don't want to let us get near him. Why is he afraid? Because you have the power to cast him out. <clears throat> James 4 and 7 tells us to submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. But we've got to submit ourselves to God. Verse 8 says to draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. <clears throat> James is not talking to sinners out there. He's talking to church folk right here. He said, cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Why is he saying that? Because sometimes we allow sin to get in our lives. And you're not going to get anywhere with God until you get that sin out of your life. We're not going to get anywhere. This is church people now. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Double-minded? What does that mean? Straddle in the fence. Make up your mind whether you want to be part of the world or you want to be part of the church. Don't try to get the best of both worlds. It's not going to work. Oh, Brother Alice, we mentioned something about, you know, these sports and games and Super Bowls and all this stuff. That's their God. And I see church folks that, that want to have a Super Bowl Sunday. And they all gather and they bring in snacks and they all sit down there in the basement and they got a big screen TV and they're watching the Super Bowl. And there's no going up there having preaching. No prayer meeting. You're partaking of a false God. That's I'm a worship church. I don't want no part of that. I've got no problem with sports. I've always, when growing up, I like to play football, I like to play basketball, I like to play baseball. You know, I like to do all kinds of different sports like that. We, we have fun doing stuff, tennis and stuff like that. But I, I guess I got one advantage over a lot of these other people. I've never been interested in watching sports on television. My dad did it. He used to aggravate me. Clear. I got other stuff I'd rather watch. You can watch an old boring golf game. Who cares? He hit the ball all the way out there. Yeah, look at that. He made it all the way to the green. Huh? I used to play golf until my dad quit paying. <laughs> I didn't want to do it that bad. And I sure didn't want to watch it. I had better things to do. I'd go out play around outside do something. Constructive. I'd go get all muddy and scratched up and everything else. <laughs> Hallelujah. I don't want to be double-minded. Get in, get your mind made up, and live for God with all your heart. Hallelujah. It's not going to be hard if we'll give it all to Jesus. Praise God. And I've, I've taken the scriptures around for a reason. I read verse 7 and verse 8, now I'm going to go to verse 5 and 6, and then I'm going to go to verse 10. This situation with being double-minded, you go up to verse 5, so do you think that the scripture saith in vain that the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? That's the carnal side of us, church, and it has to be battled against. We have a battle going on to make this carnal man submit to the spiritual side. It's human nature, okay? The scripture say, doesn't say in vain. That the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth envy. That's not the Holy Ghost. That's our human spirit. All right? But verse 6 says, But God giveth grace, more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. No proud attitude. Say, well, yeah, it might not be right, but I'm going to do it anyway. We enjoy this. All of us get together. Blah, blah, blah. You know? Now humble yourselves. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, God will turn back to us. Hallelujah. He wants us to be humble. He wants us to resist the things of the world. He wants us to be the spiritual man. And verse 10, and I'm closing on this, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. If we'll just humble ourselves, hallelujah. God, lift us up. Praise God. 
stand with me. I hope somebody got something out of this this morning. We need to really consider our ways, examine ourselves. But, uh, so Sunday school report. Love one another. That's a good thing to do. Hallelujah. The Bible tells us to do good to all men, especially them in the household of faith. God's taking care of his people. And if they want to come into God, they take care of them too. Uh, praise God. Let's just praise him for a little while here, church. He is worthy. Hallelujah. If you got a need this morning, I'm telling you, we got a God that will supply. Thank you, Jesus. As a matter of fact, I've got it. Thank you. 
Lord's house. It's not too late. Hallelujah. We'll be glad to pray with you. you. Don't want to just get prayer. I want my healing. Hallelujah. I want deliverance. Hallelujah. I want to touch it. In Jesus' name. Praise God. Well, I'm thankful for everyone that's here this morning. I hope that somehow, some way, you got something out of this this morning. Hallelujah. I needed it. Praise God. It was kind of a shotgun message. Kind of went in all kinds of different ways. But if we want a miracle from God, we're going to have to press our way in. It's going to take some effort. Hallelujah. Did you want to say something? Yeah. I, I was reminded when you were preaching about the faith about our Their faith reaching out. He didn't lay hands on him or nothing. But I don't think he thought he was so high and mighty. I was just going to my shadow and touch him. No. He was an obedient servant of God. Hallelujah. And it wasn't because their faith reached out to Peter. It was because their faith reached out to God. Hallelujah. Anybody else have a need this time? An announcement or anything special? Praise God. This Sunday service coming up, uh, Brother Grady is going to preach for us. It's going to be this next Sunday. Praise God. Thursday, <coughs> Sister Rose and I have got mountain fever. We won't be gone to the mountains. Thank you.